Hello everyone, I am Stephen Drew from the Architecture Social and this is my official podcast voice. But we have here today a fantastic guest. I have actually been on her podcast before and she's been very patient with my new busy schedule. This is the third time we're supposed to speak. Angela is here and I can't wait to hear all about what you're up to. So Angela Mazzi, without further ado, welcome to the Architecture Social Podcast. How are you? I'm so excited to be on your show. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I know. Um, well, thank you for your patience. So you, while you, I can see it as well, in the meantime, me and you are both guests in the book. So Angela, we're, we're busy, busy people. So you've been in this book, but you're up to loads of stuff right now. But I'm sure while you, you've got a presence, because you are all the way from across Atlantic, and I love that. It's all about being an international community. But I'm sure maybe some people in the UK and Europe are not so familiar with your podcast and what you're up to, Angela. So do you want to tell us a little bit about yourself, first of all? Sure. So I really, my world that I like to play in as an architect is how space feels and the impact of space on our well-being. And really, I was one of those kids that would climb on top of the refrigerator and notice that the kitchen looked and felt different from that vantage point. So I've always mm. had that kind of point of view and I've always been interested in psychology and neurology and anthropology and all the things that we learn about why we make space the way we do or how yeah. space impacts us. And I work as a medical planner, so I design hospitals and clinics and things like that. But my research specializes in design for well-being. And what I've noticed, because I've been practicing for a long time now, is that as a profession, we've sort of lost sight of the impact that our work really has. And mm. we've made an art form, a creative profession, more of a transactional encounter. And right. we're sort of playing to the lowest common denominator, competing with one another on fees, griping about developers, eating our lunch, you know, just really not saying architecture is a powerful tool. And it makes a difference and it can impact your return on investment. So let's talk about how design can make a difference for our clients, for the things that their mission is about or the things that they care about. And I have started on the side a community called Architecting, and um, it includes a podcast I do twice a week, plus a website where I offer classes and coaching, and I have a book up there, and I'm also working on a second book on time management, and Ooh. then I also have a club on Clubhouse, so we do a Monday room that is exactly about this idea of architects as healers, buildings as medicine. And then I do another club that I call Critical Conversations, which is more of a dialogue, a chat about what are some of the issues that people are facing and how can we work together as a community to overcome them? So it's really about building awareness and building that powerful network where we can be advocates not just people that comply with the building code and get things built mm, wow there's so much to unpack there so being on the front of it as a healthcare architect this should jump into that a second so i imagine since the whole pandemic i mean that's it's gone up another level the importance of what you do right so i'm so i'm amazed you have time for a clubhouse and all this stuff because i'm sure you're at the front line so just touching upon that briefly on work how has it been since 2020 have you seen a massive shift in what you do or um a, a sense of impetus or what how is it how has being a healthcare architect changed since the global pandemic 
Well, definitely there is more of a focus on infection control. And Mm -hmm. in a lot of departments, there's always been a one-way flow of clean to dirty and a separation of traffic. But that is becoming more important in settings like clinics where they needed to control where people came into the building so they could screen them and make sure they didn't have a fever and then direct them to where they needed to go. I think waiting rooms and lounge areas have changed because we've learned that we didn't really need them. So all the Mm -hmm. big waiting rooms that are, you know, in many healthcare facilities weren't even occupied because they were taking patients just in time. I think we've also seen that we can do telehealth and that in some cases it may actually be a better way for mm. patients to access care. So I think what the Clint, what the uh, virus really did was take a very risk adverse service line healthcare and make it more risky not to take a chance on doing something new than to do the status quo. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it was easier before to say, I'm not sure about that. And now it was a bigger risk not to try. Right. So interesting. And I mean, uh, I I know a few health characteristics in the UK and it's definitely um, been quite a bit of a shakeup and there's stuff like, um, for instance, hotels earlier in the pandemic in the UK were just instantly, whereas the healthcare system before, I think that there was lots of procedures and red tape, you know, like how you go through things and then suddenly things were getting greenlit overnight. So hotels, as I was saying, would could be turned straight away into, um, you know, like uh, little hospital locations and all this stuff. So, I mean, that's quite interesting, but I love because I was actually fortunate to be a guest on the Architecting Podcast, and there's so much there as well. And we've kind of got a different themes. There's quite a few different themes there. There's the architecture is healing and a lot of this stuff as well. So we've got your profession as a healthcare architect as well. But what kind of uh, brought you up to the point where you were like, Do you know what, I think there's room for something in the community like architecting. Sure, so... There's plenty out there in the community that spotlights different architects or talks about practice. And there's you know, a lot of really great shows. But what I noticed was missing was something that would help people stay inspired and help right. them implement these things in their daily life. Because it's really mm. easy to interview some firm principal from a big international firm and they tell you their rags to riches story and you think, well, but that's them. That's for them. Mm -hmm. They're here. I'm only four years out of school. That's not for me. So more, how do, how do we navigate our careers in the day to day? So a lot of things that I will focus on are things like negotiating skills or How do you develop your personal brand or should you be a subject matter expert on if so, in what? And a lot of episodes are just about overcoming limiting beliefs and these feelings of things that have to be a certain way or that's just the way it is when it really doesn't. And um, connecting with your passions. Most people I talk to know if they're unhappy, but they don't know why. So they'll say, I want to change jobs. And then they'll get a new job. And within a year, they have the exact same complaints because it isn't the job, it's them. They don't know what to ask for because they haven't taken the time to get the personal clarity that they need to be able to pursue the things that would really make them happy. Yeah, that's really interesting because I actually had um, a career coaching session the other day with uh, someone who's really bright and smart. And the, the, the topic of the conversation was, you know, what kind of jobs do I move to? And I think what was the discovery is that if you move to another job at another, because this is someone who um, just had a young family. And so 
the idea of going to another high profile architecture practice and working long hours is no longer appealing. Yet there's a temptation to kind of keep up that ideology of I've got to work for the best of the best of the best. And um, in the end, we kind of broke down that barrier. And um, and that was great. But you're right. It's you, I think naturally we as humans can just go on to the next thing. And so say now you work, you've, you've worked at a high pedigree architecture practice and the hours are long. You're right, going to another place, and if the if the prerequisites are the same, it's not going to change. You know, don't be surprised when you rock up and you're doing seven, eight o'clock again because you've just traded the same for the same. So I find that really interesting as well, and I quite like that because I listened to one or two of the podcasts after I did the episodes, and I found that they had quite a relaxing vibe. Now I don't know whether I've got a relaxing vibe. But uh, every podcast has their own values. Now, I'm going to ask a quick of a question because we both run Clubhouse. Okay. Now, I'm, I've got a controversial opinion on Clubhouse. I kind of run a room, so I should be all loving, loving Clubhouse. I do wonder how, lo- how much longevity in there is because I think Clubhouse has been an amazing way for people to connect. In a world where we can't connect, but also we have lots of other clubhouses um, that are coming. So Spotify and, you know, Facebook mm-hmm. are, all, are building this stuff up. So wh- what have you enjoyed about Clubhouse and where do you see the Clubhouse going? So I guess there's two questions there, but um, I'd love to know your thoughts on it. Sure. So one of the things I love about Clubhouse is that it's this smorgasbord of stuff. So you can find discussion groups on just about anything. So I don't actually go into a whole lot of the architecture rooms, but I have gone into, for example, a lot of podcasting rooms and people are so generous with their time and so willing to answer your questions. And I think it's a great resource for building a bigger network. I mean, I, I'm a huge advocate for architects getting outside of our bubble. I think we, as a profession, are kind of snotty about, ah, oh, you know, if you're not part of my world, you don't exist. When our work mm. is so much better and we're so much well in for when we reach beyond what we know. And I I like that about Clubhouse. I have found guests for my podcast on Clubhouse that are not architects, but who I thought had really interesting perspective um, within the club that I have, the architecting club. It's been a way to kind of converge who I am in my day job and what I'm doing with architecting Mm. because I'm finding a lot of my colleagues from work who probably wouldn't have listened to the podcast will come for these conversations about architects as healers or the critical conversations. So I'm reaching a different audience in many cases by being on Clubhouse. Yeah, I think that's a really great way to put it because I actually have met people on Clubhouse, which I wouldn't have in any other means. And that's what's amazing about it. Although I do think that there can be, and maybe this is just from my perspective, but running a room, it can be this like reciprocal, hey, here we go again, here we go, here we go. So maybe I'm suffering like the talk show syndrome, um, (laughs) talk show host syndrome, where I'm just like, oh gosh, here we go again on a Wednesday. What I think is important about that is like, when hopefully we can meet up in all these events, it, it kind of shows the value of like meeting people and getting along. And I love what you were saying about being generous with information because Clubhouse is, I think, generous on that. And podcasts are a really good way to do that as well. And I think that on your episodes, you do that quite a lot. So I've got another question to just whack in here as well, because at the start, you talked about the Clubhouse and we covered that a bit and people should check out your Clubhouse and you know, kind of explore Clubhouse, especially just before it maybe moves, uh, we get the next shift. Yes. But you talked about your audio, um, you're doing a ebook. Wow. How mm-hmm. do you find the time to do all this stuff, first of all? Well, <laughs> I, I think part of it is doing what you're passionate about. And when you do yeah. what you love and you feel really inspired, 
you can work a lot faster and be a lot more productive. Uh, but it's it's also, I think, about saying, what are my priorities? Because so many times I'm trying to coach a younger architect and they want to move up in their career. And I'm like, well, what are you doing besides coming to work every day? And yeah. I'll recommend things like, you know, get involved in a local charity volunteering or a community group or an architecture organization like the AIA and I'm too busy is their answer. But when you look at how they spend their day, it's just they're making different choices about what they want to do with their time. So if you would rather coach softball, well, now you don't have time for this. So what what I try to do that helps me is stacking my interests. So there's sort of a convergence and effort I do for one thing, I can leverage across multiple things. So, you know, for example, with the podcast, a lot of times I I don't plan the episodes or record them ahead of time. It's the night before. And I just sit there and go, what's on my heart today? Did I have an experience that either worked out really well that I want to share or a story somebody told me or something really annoyed me, but I want to unpack it and show people how to move beyond or what lessons there might be in that situation. And then when I do the clubhouse rooms, Often that will be the topic is just going a little bit deeper into that subject. And the same thing with the social media, just putting more nuanced information around those issues so that it does let me repurpose content and I'm not constantly creating something new. And also with Clubhouse, for the for the one room, I have a partner, Megan Mazzocco, who works with me. And between the two of us, we book guests. And our goal is for that particular room that we always have a guest. So that makes it a little bit easier because they do most of the talking and the audience can ask the guest questions. Yeah, I'm really because there's, there's two sides of the clubhouse, because one of the frustrations I had at the start and look, I'm, I'm going to move on from this because I'm aware I'm, I'm just going clubhouse crazy. But I, it was a shame when it was just um, um, uh, iPhones, because unfortunately, there were many Android users which couldn't go on to it. But I kind of like that transient part of clubhouse where you're in the moment. It's a conversation. And if you're not in the room then the conversation goes. And I think there's a really nice quality to that because there's so much online and there's so much recorded and there's so much availability. And um, so this kind of scarcity factor, I think, is really appealing. Um, but on the other hand, you know, it is quite nice to have stuff like this out there because then this podcast is permanently um, online in the ether for the, the test of time. And the value of that is that people can dip in and out of it and hopefully find something stimulating from this conversation. And it, you know, in that sense, it can be quite timeless. Um, but so moving on from that aside though, what I was gonna say, so, I mean, look, I really, it's impressive how you can juggle everything around. And look, I'm gonna, I'm gonna learn from that as well. But so what is, um, I would love to know what is your next agenda? Oh, but before that, I had a burning thought that popped into my head, right? So you mentioned, yeah, sorry, because look at me, I'm like, this is how my brain works. I just get loads of stuff popping up. The, the point that you raised where people talk about not having enough time is so nonsense. And I base that on me. So I remember, um, all the time thinking, oh, I don't have time to do stuff. And then think about it. How often do we spend like wasting time on our phone in the morning or the mm -hmm. evening? I know so many people, including myself, that will be maybe on TikTok or Instagram or LinkedIn or Facebook or wherever. And you're just scrolling. And like, I think that if you just replace that time with something, you can get a lot done. And like in one hour a day, you can get seriously a lot done. And I think that that really helps. And so what I would say is that anyone that thinks they haven't got time for something, if you cut out that like, um, like that empty space, you can be a lot more productive. Do you agree with that, Angela? 
Absolutely. It's it's how you allocate your day, right? And what you prioritize. But I'm actually exploring this topic in a ebook I am in the process of writing mm-hmm. right now. It's called Time Builder. And I was inspired to write it because I hear the two biggest complaints. I'm too busy and I'm overwhelmed from the architects that I talk to. And I yeah. really felt that I needed to, you know, reach out in this way and cover this topic because yeah. some of it, you're exactly right, how you choose to spend your time, but also it's how our brain works, right? Our brain is really a search engine. And if we use our brain the way it, it can be optimized to use, it can find a lot of solutions for us as we go about doing other things. We just have to know what to query it to do or taking care of our bodies. Like most of us feel like we just have this like meat suit on that we have to drag across the finish line every day and we live in our heads. If we actually take the time for self-care, we'll find that our thinking is clearer, we're healthier, we have more energy. So that helps you get more done in less time. Then there's, you know, our biggest enemies, I think, are perfectionism and procrastination because mm. we just judge everything we do. We drive ourselves crazy. And when we do that, we're in an anxiety loop. So we're not mm. actually getting something done. We're just fretting and fretting and fretting yeah. or iterating and criticizing, iterating and criticizing instead of saying, how do I make decisions and move forward? And when is it good enough that I can learn what I need to learn and move on and mm. course correct versus it has to be perfect and it has to be like, you know, the unveiling where we pull the the sheet off <laughs> and say, ta-da, that really trips us up a lot. And I think we learn that in school where nothing we ever do is good enough. And God forbid you ever showed a professor something that you'd only worked on for three or four hours. They would never accept that as a solution. They would mm-hmm. push you to keep iterating. And I think we become our own or worst enemies that way. And then I would say the the last thing that really hurts us with time is being able, I call it being able to receive. So part of that is delegating, right? Mm -hmm. Always saying, who else can do this? And that's hard because we're used to being kind of the lone wolf as the architect. And we want ownership and recognition for what we're doing. And when we delegate, no one else is going to do it the way you do it. And Mm -hmm. there's that fear that's attached to letting other people run with it. But I think what we have to learn is that there's more or less four basic communication styles, and we're all one of those four. So when we talk, only about a quarter of the people that are in our audience are actually resonating with what we're saying. When we empower other people to share our message and they have one of those different communication styles, it's reaching more people, it's having more impact, but it takes letting go to really move forward in the way you want, not working harder, which is the myth that most of us fall into. Mm, That's really interesting. When you were talking about that, I was getting flashbacks in my head to times in the past. They do it a lot less lately, which is good. I'm probably too busy to let it happen. But I used to remember when I was a student or sometimes when I was working in places and I knew I had a task. And I'm sure we've all done it. We've all procrastinated with it. And you've got the deadline, especially in architecture school. And instead of like doing the work, you think, "Uh oh, I've got the deadline on Monday. I really should do it. Oh, I'll just do it a bit later. And then, but you're right. You're fretting in that moment. So I used to do that. And it's so nonsensical because 
if you just like knuckle down and did the work, then you know you would finish the task. But I would do this thing where I would self perpetuate in that state and push it, push it, push it, and then you know I would you know have like a freak out on sunday or whatever before the monday and it's so unhealthy but there is a lot of this built around i do think that things are get things are getting better and and also i think people are aware of this problem now but i guess there's a lot of talk around architecture as a culture of working hard towards deadlines and right up until the final hour um, and there's also a culture uh, there's also a talk about that is you know, an antiquated way of looking at it. And it's not healthy because people burn out, right? Because if you're doing long hours and you, so you're mentally fretting and you're stressing and you're, you're in the office or you're doing your project and, and it's, you're full on, it's not sustainable. I mean, what's your thoughts, Angela, on like um, high workload or that kind of um, that perception, that old school perception of burning the midnight oil in architecture to get stuff done? Well, it's toxic. Um, And for so many reasons. So first of all, it creates self-doubt and indecisiveness because you're Mm -hmm. spinning and you're iterating or like you were saying, Steve, you're making something bigger and scarier than it is. And it's so intimidating. You're not approaching it. You're just thinking about approaching it. So there's that element, the the confidence factor part of it, mm-hmm. the willingness to fail part of it. But there's also what it does to you physically and mentally. You get burned out, you get sick. I um, developed chronic fatigue syndrome my second year of architecture school from pulling wow. too many all-nighters and was extremely sick. But what I learned from that was that I I got reached a point where I physically couldn't pull an all-nighter because my body would just break down. So yeah. I had to work differently. And it's possible, but we're not taught that. There's that badge of honor of saying, I worked all night for the last three nights. I haven't slept in three days, you know, and people brag when they shouldn't be. Yeah, so there's there's crazy. that physical toll. But the the last thing is we are a creative profession. And what do we do when we're exhausted? We do what we know works. Well, if you know it will work, it's not creative. You know, it's sort of a paradox yeah. out there that really we have to have the science mind, that willingness to experiment and to learn and that's where iteration is useful is that we're trying we're failing we're not viewing failure as a dirty word instead we're saying how can i make it better based on what i've learned and we're listening well you can't do all of that if you don't have confidence and you're exhausted so it's sort of a three-pronged um hit on yeah. everything that we want to do as a profession when we work that way. Mm. I think you're right. I think that's well said. I remember in my last year of architecture, I did finally, I broke the curse of as myself putting myself into all nighters. And I did the disciplined approach like yourself. And you're right. No one taught me of like, I can't remember anyone saying like, you probably shouldn't do all nighters. You should work earlier during the day. I just, no one talked about it. It was just, it was less about that. It's more about the project, the project and how good the project was. And, and it's crazy. Like when you're saying about that bragging culture, because I, as a person, I can't function after one day of not sleeping. So whenever I would do an all-nighter, Angela, I would be the person that was like, um, like having borderline a mental breakdown by the printer because I couldn't get it working. And like, you look back and it's almost funny. But then on the other hand, it's just, it's insane that we all did that. The one bit of hope I have, and it would be interesting to get your thoughts on that, is that the one good thing about this year, and maybe it's because I'm more involved, and I think if you feel unconnected with the industry, the best thing, in my opinion, is to do all this stuff, to go on the clubhouse, to get involved in Instagram, to go and, you know, I have the architecture social. I mean, that's a, a point. You should 
talk to people on there. And I think that you can, the more and more you're involved with people, the more and more there's a sense of progression. But what I was going to say, aside from that, is that I do think that we're all really talking about these issues this year. So we're talking about mental health and well-being, and that's been talked about before. But now I think it has a sense of impetus and realness, and people are starting to think like, do you know what? It's not okay anymore. And the other thing, Angela, that we've had a big thing in the UK of, which is kind of attached with, to with mental health, but is also with salaries, unpaid mm-hmm. hours, overtime and self-worth. And it's a big topic at the moment so far that Reba, um, the Royal Institute of British Architects, had to, you know, we had to acknowledge it. They've acknowledged it. But what I mean is it was so present in the public realm that we can't avoid these issues anymore. I mean, what's your perspective in the last year or two on um, people talking up and salaries and mental health and all this stuff. Well, I think it does put a spotlight on what is necessary versus what is busy work and yeah. working more strategically and working in ways that we wouldn't have found acceptable before because we had no other choice. I mean, I did a virtual mock up review with a client where they had a few people in a space and I was on a laptop being wheeled around (laughs) on a desk chair. Oh my gosh. But you have to because that was the only way to do it. So I think we've started to say, you know, the old clunky, laborious way of doing things, we can't do it anymore. And we've shown that this other, other ways of working are equally or maybe even more effective. So why are we still doing this? But I also think when we when we ask people to work a lot of overtime and we push this iteration cycle, not only does it undermine our self-confidence, but it basically says our time has no value. Mm-hmm. And if we don't value our time, how can we expect our clients to value our time? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that's true. And I think that's the big learning curve. And for anyone listening, um, if you kind of, you feel like, oh gosh, I'm in a dark place, or maybe I'm not doing that. Well, don't worry. This is kind of like, it takes, you You can't just snap your fingers and change. Or if that happens, it's like anything. I think you're more likely to kind of relapse onto our ways. But it's. I think it's just a conscious way of like, constantly progressing to that point and realizing maybe this is your goal okay and then every day you try and make it a bit better is that something that you constantly you talk about a little bit in your coaching then Angela yes because you know change is hard right and yeah we form habits and our habits feel really comfortable to us and our habits take the effort out of certain things we do, whether they're good habits or not. So when we want to make a change, it takes a lot of conscious effort. So one, we have to really want that change. And Mm. two, we have to be committed to the effort it's going to take to implement it and know that we're going to have setbacks. We can't Mm. just like if your goal was to lose weight, would you really lose 50 pounds in two weeks and keep it off? That's not a realistic goal. You Mm -hmm. would expect that you were going to lose maybe a couple pounds a week and some weeks you might gain a pound and you would be forgiving with yourself. And I think we need to have that same attitude as we change our minds about our profession. And I talked earlier about the limiting beliefs. And the thing about limiting beliefs is we don't question beliefs. To us, they are reality. They are the only way it is. So when Uh you start to do this work, it can feel really strange. And other people around you may not understand because we've all bought into certain beliefs about the way we have to practice architecture. Yeah, it's interesting. I think you're right. And 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 uh, yeah, and sometimes it's good not to be too harsh on yourselves as well because it is really difficult making changes. And the other thing that I think is a really interesting topic is that failure. Okay, so this kind of idea of failure—it's like a massive stigma. 
Now, I fail all the time, okay? We were giggling earlier about the fact that my diary is a complete failure, and that's an opportunity to fix it, and it's acknowledging it, and, and realizing, okay, I can do better. But also, what I would say is, that's a little thing, but more profound in the past, that I run a recruitment business years ago, and if financially it was a massive success, but it was a complete failure because at the time, um, you know, me and my business partner had completely different views of where we wanted to take the company. And it was an incredibly stressful time. And ending that company really took a piece out of me, you know. But now I look back and it's a valuable lesson. And I kind of joke at the moment, Angela, that because of that whole experience, I've got a thick skin, you know. You can send me a legal letter wherever out there. And they ain't going to phase me much anymore because when you've been some, through something really difficult and traumatic, it's really hard. But that was a big failure. And what I'm trying to say from it is that that quote unquote failure, I find a really valuable lesson in life. So, I mean, what's your views on failure? Well, I think it's necessary because it's how how we learn what will and won't work, how we mm-hmm. learn process. But I think a lot of the stigma around failure is based on what we're hooked into believing about ourselves, Mm -hmm. right? So if you called me a green monkey, I wouldn't get angry at you because I know I'm not a green monkey, right? There's no, there's no attachment to that. But if you Mm -hmm. told me I had no ability to work with other people and I was difficult there's probably grains of truth in that, right? So mm-hmm. it, rather than being able to hear, oh, I need to work on team building skills, what the person hears is nobody likes me. I'm a horrible person, right? There's this whole story that gets kicked into action because there's grains of truth and whatever the failure was or whatever criticism they received. And so what we have to do is practice that detachment where we can say, okay, that didn't work. But I, Mm. you know, every day is a starting line. Every day we are inventing ourselves and we can be whoever and whatever we want to be. And our failures are a way for us to get better. It's not about keeping ourselves down. And when we let them keep us down, we have to realize that we're doing that to ourselves. It's Mm. other people can't do that to you. You do Mm. it to yourself. I think that's well said. There's so much we can talk about on that. And I think that this could take up even... You know, it's it's really important because it's so central to us all. But there is a bit of a good note to it as well, because I think that we as old people, we can learn and we can adjust. And, you know, I, I'm constantly making mistakes. But at the same time, there's a lot of great stuff that happens on that journey. And I think part most important bit is that journey and constantly keeping going. Exactly. So on, exactly. On, yeah. And on vain on that. So what is the I know you mentioned the book. Right, which is going to be amazing. Time management. I probably should buy that. So there you go. <laughs> That's got me written all over. What? Um, so what's kind of... Oh, let, let me rephrase the question because it's twofold. I would love to know what you, you plan to do next. But also, equally, a fascinating question is... And because as well, I'm in the UK and you're in America. You're in the States. Um, what I'd love to know is... Where do you see things going in the next maybe six months, you know, in the industry now in this like second or third wave and all this stuff? Where do you see things going and what are your plans, Angela? So in terms of where our profession's going, I think architects actually emerged out of all this with a little bit more respect and status than we might have had in the past because people have realized how important the quality of their environment is. Um, Here in the U.S., home improvement, 
home building, moving homes, remodeling, landscaping has gone through the roof because as people have spent time at home, all of a right. sudden they're looking around and they're like, why am I living like this? And, and I think it starts in the home, right? It starts in your personal space, but you all, you realize pretty quickly If I want to be in a quality environment at home, why wouldn't I want my child to be in a quality environment at school? Or if I'm going to be working in the office, why why am I accepting, you know, fluorescent lights and cubicles? Mm. It can be better. We can have better. We can do better. And I think we're also understanding the role that air quality, for example, you know, and other kinds of just quality of the um, air, noise, things like that, the impact that those have on our health and our well-being and starting to say, I'm not just going to go into some box. This box needs to be designed to have the right kind of filtration, to have natural air coming in and good ventilation, good lighting. I can't have noxious chemicals off gassing around me or loud noises. I think we're just all starting to appreciate what the difference is between a quality environment that supports our well-being and spaces that we coped with and tolerated in the past. And I think there's less appetite for that. And especially since we've done so much remotely over the last year and a half, there's this sense that you can opt out if it's not good enough. So we can raise Mm -hmm. our standards because we have choices. Mm, Well said. Well, I think that's um, that's really insightful. I think the same thing in the UK, whereas before, so it's just talking literally about housing, right? So you typically have a plan in the UK and it would be all about bedrooms. No one wanted an office, whereas now our home office is kind of going to be a big thing, right? Because we're kind of moving towards that world. And what I think is interesting is in terms of flexibility. So I do think that architecture practices need to have some sort of flexibility. And I'm sure it would be interesting to hear your thoughts on this. My understanding and my opinion of the architecture industry before, the idea of working at home was outrageous. You needed to be in the office and architectural practice will crumble if people are working at home. And then so it was really like uh, during the pandemic going into like the unknown of, oh my gosh, how is architecture going to survive? And miraculously, everything still worked. And so... That's probably the only good thing that came out of it. Well, there's a few good things, but that's the main thing, I think, in the industry. I reckon, though, in the future that there will need to be some sort of flexibility with homework and the office. But naturally, I think some companies are going to want people back in the office. And I kind of understand from the point of view of, like, at Accra Larry, where I work, there is definite a magic having people in the room on certain days. I think the question that we have is, it doesn't need to be five days a week. We can we can balance mm-hmm. it out. What's your thoughts on that kind of split and that and working that home slash in the office? Well, I think there's definitely the chance encounter when you're getting coffee with someone you wouldn't have talked to at all because yeah. you don't work on the same projects. And that gets lost. Um, I also think when we first started working from home, my thoughts were, this is great. I could sleep in because I don't have a commute. I could take a walk. Maybe I can do yoga in the middle of the day. Uh, What I found was because everyone knew you were available, my whole day would be booked with wall-to-wall meetings. Some days I would have to turn the camera and the microphone off and eat my lunch because I literally had no time from 7 a.m. to 6 p.m. was just solid meetings. So in that sense, it was different. But in the sense of what were some of the positive things, well, we have five offices at GBBN and we do a lot of work across offices. And so if our team in Cincinnati was in a conference room and we had one person from Minneapolis and one person from Pittsburgh, they couldn't we could see their faces and their heads because they were, you know, on Zoom, but they could see a conference room. 
and they mm. couldn't really read the room or see the individual piece people that were in it. So being on a Zoom call was sort of a level playing field for people who were not working out of the same location that will get lost if as we go back because the people in the room especially if they're the majority the people on the team are always going to feel more cohesive and the people who are not in person are always going to feel like the outsider so mm. i think i think there is something to be said about feeling more connected when mm. you when you're remote but you also don't have the social part of it. It's interesting. My daughter was a freshman in college this year, which was not a great year to go to a new place where you know nobody because there were no opportunities to socialize. Oh and the first semester was really rough. But the second semester, what the professor started doing was they would just hand over the hosting of the Zoom call to one of the students when they were done teaching and let them all stay online and talk to one another. And she actually started to make friends because that portal being left open was allowing those casual conversations. And that's kind of cool. Yeah, I think that as well, because... The yeah, architecture social is made, it has been a digital platform, but I guess I, what I'm trying to bring into it and, you know, because I do also work in a, in a shared office and I, I quite like that um, aspect of it as well. But I think that um, going from digital only to kind of semi-digital physical is the, is the way forward. So look, at, it's kind of an in, at this point, at like the 45 minute mark, I normally like to, and we can do, I love to turn the tables and let my guests ask a few questions. I, but you have also asked me a few questions before, and you can check out that on your podcast, <laughs> so the Architecting Podcast. So you, if you want to have a full 50 minutes of Angela asking me some interesting questions, <laughs> then check out that. But Angela, as it's been, I guess, a month since we, um, or prob no, probably longer now, it's two months yeah, since we did months, that. Yeah, yeah. gosh, where's time going? Do you have any new questions for me that you'd like to ask? Well, I think what you've done since we talked, I know you had these things in the works with Architecture Social, but to really have some robust classes and coaching components built in that is a really cool thing. Um, have you seen that people are taking advantage of that resource and what insights are you getting about where the gaps are in the profession as you start to offer more things? Wow. Okay. That's a good question. I've got lots of views on this. So there's, there's a few. Um, so on the architecture social, I catalog a lot of free online resources and they're all there. They're all, people can use them. People can jump in and out of them and I think some people have found them useful and that's what they're there for and that's the one thing I do like over the clubhouse in the moment is that if I can record something and it's there on YouTube everyone can get it in theory you know I know there's an element of digital poverty with things but provided you someone can get internet then they have that resource and they can have my thoughts and in theory you can apply that people can apply that to the job search um, of course it's my opinion but it's based on anecdotal evidence over the last seven years of recruitment and working in the industry. So my gut instinct, I think, is pretty sharp because those are the things that I've seen people do successfully that get jobs, you know? So where I'm going with this is, though, that the coaching is quite interesting. And so I do like one-on-one -on -one because there's an element of accountability to it. And I bizarrely, while I, and this is where I'm going, is that I, well, I think free content's amazing, but I do think that there's a le less onus on the person and less accountability. Whereas with coaching, bizarrely, because there's a financial um, uh, transaction and commitment, I then find that that gives me much more scope to have a lot more um, impetus and have a lot more um, effect on the person's uh, outcome. So in that session, you get my unfiltered time, and because there's a transaction there, I naturally am motivated to to help. 
Um, so that's what I found really interesting because sometimes with the free content, I'll have it out then. And what I've got, to, and I, I, my thing that I'm learning lately is always to hold people accountable in a nice way. Okay, and what I mean by that is, I go, have you checked out the video? And they go, yeah. And I go, what do you think about the part where I said, send a hundred CVs out? Have you done it? No. Okay, well, do that first, then talk to me. And it's mm -hmm. not from being mean. It's that I have to push people to being accountable. And I think one of the downsides is that with the architecture social, there is an element where it will always be free. But with that, there's less requirements on the individual. And I totally get that. I totally get that. But that's my challenge because I do want people to find the stuff really useful. But this is the formula that I haven't fully solved, but I'm trying to solve. And so, you know me, I always tell you what's on my brain. It's this quandary. So it's yeah. like, I really like the coaching. Um, and, and the financial aspect's great because you know it, it, that the architecture social costs money to run. So also finding something where it can... Uh, be self-perpetuating is really useful and really important because um, that will secure the long-term um, the long-term lifespan of the social. So that kind of all works hand in hand, and this is what I'm going with. So my big question at the moment is: How do I make content online which is picked up by people? You know, it's not ignored. It's not listen to and that's really difficult you know because some person can listen to the same this podcast and get something out of it profound and if so great at the same time though things can get missed we're in a very busy online world the youtube algorithm is telling people to click 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 and uh, it's getting harder and harder for everyone including myself online to to hold on to their attention and there's so much free content out there, where do you go? And one of the things I think, Angela, is that free content doesn't necessarily mean it's good. Absolutely. Yeah, that's where I'm at. Does that, how, what's your thoughts on, on yeah. that? And there's anything you'd like to pick from there? No, I think you're right. Um, free content gives that no like trust. So people can find you, they can get to know you, they can get a sense of, do I like the brand that this yeah. person is because our content can be very similar but who resonates so you do need the free stuff but i think when people have to pay they're making a different level of commitment to themselves more than anything else exactly and they're if they don't follow through they're wasting their money so they're a little bit more motivated which is important but 100%. i also think architects are really smart people and we have an incredibly diverse skill set but the yep. bad side of that is we think we can do everything we're like huge d I wires. So it's like, I can do graphic design. I can figure out this. I can do that. So what we end up doing is thinking, why should I pay for this? I can learn it myself. And what I would say is not only is not all free content created equal, but the time you're spending to find all this content and piece it together into an action plan with no one to hold you accountable, you're not valuing your time. Coaching yeah. can feel expensive, but when you work with a coach, you're going to get results so much quicker and you're going to feel different. It's sort of mm -hmm. like when you go shopping and you splurge on the really expensive thing is it really better than if you got the thing that was at the discount department store? But it's how it makes you feel, right? And yeah. the fact that it makes you feel different means you behave different. And the same thing with coaching. When you invest in yourself, you feel differently than if you have this mentality of, I'm only worth what I can find for free. Mm. I think that's um, 
well said and that's that's kind of where i'm at and it goes two ways because i remember at first you fit i when i started thinking about coaching i was like and so my pricing is like 97 pounds now um and i'm really transparent about that which is because i think that is interesting because sometimes money can seem like an odd topic it can seem an odd topic when people are discussing their own salaries and it can also seem an odd topic in terms of a service like and it's like oh you know do i put the price online and i'm like yeah of course i do but then actually 97 pounds in my opinion is quite modest when you're getting seven years of experience and within that hour we can quickly flash through and at least get one thing this that we're discussing in that hour nailed you know, maybe if it's a big career move, you need more sessions or whatever. But in one hour, you can really thrash something out. And what I find is that the other thing is sometimes with the architecture social. So before we were talking today, I was dealing with the text on the social because I, I at the main page. It, the bizarre thing is, is all this stuff in the social and the main page, Angela, it doesn't explain what it does. So I'm struggling with that. <laughs> But then if I ask someone their opinion, and so that's what I did, I asked one of my colleagues, what do you think the text? And he went, Brr. And I was like, oh gosh, yes, when you say that, it's so much easier. And I think that can be the value of, of coaching is because when you're in the driving seat, or you can get tunnel vision. Whereas I think that if you have a third person's perspective who is purely there because you've elected them to help you you've chosen them you know and you're paying them to offer unfiltered helpful advice and to listen and let you come to your own decisions then there's something really valuable out of it i mean what's your thoughts on that yeah, definitely listening to your audience because you can generate brilliant content that nobody really cares about. People care about the things that they're struggling with in the moment. And mm. it's when you've done everything you know to do, you've looked at all the free resources and your situation isn't getting better. And you've reached that point where you say, enough, this isn't okay anymore you know you need help and you have to be attuned to that ideal client and say what is he or she going through what is the thing that is their breaking point and i actually um am part of some facebook groups with like one is women in architecture another is mothers in architecture and it's really cool just to hear the stories and to see the things and the recurring themes and what they're not necessarily things that I would have ever thought of because they're not mm. my struggle. They're not my story, but they're a huge unmet need. And so yeah. it helps direct what you want to offer. Mm. Well said. Well, look, we're approaching the nice hour mark, which is amazing. <laughs> so where can people find you, Angela, if they want to drop you a message after this podcast? Sure. So the best place to go is architectingpodcast.com. And mm -hmm. from there, you can see the courses I offer, the books. There's lots of free downloads on there. You can access the podcast from there and also get information about the clubhouse room. I'm also on Instagram at Architecting Podcast. So you can DM me through Instagram or you can email me at Angela at ArchitectingPodcast.com. And I'd love to have some of your listeners join our community and add their voices to the mix. Yeah, and also I'll post this on the Architecture Social Forum. And you all remember that, so people can drop you a DM, mm -hmm. they can't can they? They can do that so, too, yes. We're just, there's so many ways of connecting as we're at the moment, isn't yeah. it? But yeah. that's amazing. You've been a fabulous guest, Angela. So Thank you. the virtual audience is very happy. I think that was a great show. So I'm going to end this show now. Thank you, everyone, for listening. Angela, if you can stay on the line one second while the podcast uploads, that would be great. And everyone, have a fantastic day, night, wherever you are. And keep going. See you soon. Take care. Bye-bye.